All right, my friends. I just pressed the let's go live a button on this beautiful Monday. We're back to business here after an amazing weekend. I hope you had an amazing weekend as well. And, you know, we're right on time as usual. Arizona, of course, doesn't change time. Right on time. Perfect. Right on the money. I know it's daylight savings time. Apparently, other states in this country do something. They move their clocks around. We don't do that here in Arizona. But apparently, the rest of the country has moved. It's good to see everybody. I'm glad you made it. So, of course, Arizona does not move. So, this is our time moving forward, absent any other changes. It's great to see you. It looks like the tubes are working. That's good. Daylight savings time didn't fry the tubes. So, we can go ahead and get started. Let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we are talking about Fannie Willis and a new filing that made it into Judge Scott McAfee's courtroom as we patiently await his ruling that is due any minute now. Many are saying it's gonna come on Friday. We'll see. That, of course, is his self-imposed deadline. But this is a new submission that came in from Robert Cheeley. Robert Cheeley is an, an attorney in Georgia. And he's somebody who appeared in front of Georgia on the 2020 hearings that took place there in Fulton County and elsewhere. And so we're gonna talk about a motion that he sent in. It's a nice one. It's about 20 pages or so. And it's saying, you know, Fanny, not only did she have a conflict of interest that was problematic at the outset of this whole saga, but now she's committed perjury and arguably a conspiracy for witness tampering. And there's sufficient evidence to support that, according to Robert Cheely. And I would tend to agree. I mean, look, if they're going to draw fake charges for all of the 19 co-defendants in this case, like Sidney Powell for hiring an investigator to go do some investigations, like lawyers regularly do, well, why don't they just turn around? What's good for the fannies, good for the fanny, you know, so they can just investigate them for their RICO case, for their conspiracy, for a cover up to tamper with witnesses and to commit perjury. Then we're going to see what a Georgia senator, you remember him, Representative Reverend Warnock, is out talking about Fannie Willis. Doesn't say much, but we'll hear from him. So we'll spend some time on that motion to see what is inside. And of course, this is the big week. We're waiting for McAfee to drop this opinion any day now. And it should be a lot of fun to unpack. Is she going to be disqualified? I don't know. Is, is the case going to be dismissed? We really don't know. But it's going to be coming soon. We are looking forward to it. Then after we're done with Fanny, we're going to turn our attention to Bragg over in New York. Because there is another trial that is looming afoot. We have... Of course, if you go over to robertgovea.com, links are in the description. We have our cal the calendar now is up. And so you can add this to your calendar. Just click this button here. It's a Google calendar. So you just add it to your phone, add it to your you know, uh, personal calendar, whatever. And the show's on there. But you'll see Alvin Bragg, the trial starts on the 25th. That's not next week, but the following week. Two weeks, man. Jury selection is about to be starting in the Alvin Bragg case. Trump prosecution, Michael Cohen, all this stuff, of course, involved. And so Trump is now submitting, this is an interesting motion. It's getting a little bit of grief on the, you know, lefty X accounts. They're saying that this is all, you know, oh, Trump's presidential immunity. This is like, oh, what's he going to do? Uh, you know, assassinate his political rivals using a SEAL Team 6? Huh? You know, that type of stuff. That, oh, okay, I guess his, his presidential immunity covers up his hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and so on and so forth. But it's actually an interesting argument because some of the, well, we'll break it down, but some of the payments were made while he was president. And of course, we don't know what the Supreme Court is going to say about presidential immunity and if they draw a hard line at certain locations. So in other words, we've got to put the New York criminal trial on hiatus because some of the evidence in the New York trial is subject to what could be presidential immunity protections, depending on what SCOTUS says. And so since SCOTUS is working on this, we can't continue this trial, which is scheduled in two weeks. So we'll break down that motion. Again, it's another good one from Trump's team. We'll see what Weissman says about this. He says Trump's an outlaw and you know he should be, I guess, maybe indict him again. We'll see what his uh, solution is. And then Byron Donalds is here. Of course, he's talking about Joe Biden and what Congress is doing to investigate his criminality. But at the end of this clip, he says that there are clearly two tiers of justice 
Trump is being put through the ringer while the other side can do whatever they want, whatever they want. Go on cruises, go to Belize, go to Napa Valley, maybe have some classified documents conversation with Liz Cheney, swing by Hunter Biden's place with his putty in L.A. You know, who knows what they're doing over there and then going to the Oscars. Anyways, the point is we got some good business to attend to. A couple of nice filings that we'll unpack here today. And we're grateful to have you here and with us. Now, this morning, we had a great members-only stream. We were talking about what Biden was up to. He was traveling around, some of the political updates. We were seeing uh, what Trump ha- what happened with Trump over the weekend at the UFC, which was a wild scene. He walks out talking about the energy, some of the polls, what the Biden administration is doing to you know, attempt to cover up for his dementia and other things. We had a great conversation. We'd have great morning streams and Saturday streams at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. It's our members-only community. We'd love to have you. Also, you can join on YouTube as a member. And I see we've got some great new members coming in. We'll say hello to everybody after the show. And we appreciate you joining us. You also get those morning streams and those Saturday shows on YouTube. We also have robertgovea.com, of course. If you want to get any of these PDFs that we read through here on the show. We post them on our website after the show is over so that you can download them. As I mentioned, we also have our calendar, our community calendar, which is right here at robertgovea.com slash calendar. You can, and this is gonna get a lot busier, okay? So my team is combing through all the dates right now and they're adding some stuff to this. So we've got, let's see, next month's gonna be very busy. Supreme Court deadlines, immunity briefs are due. Then we've got oral arguments on the 25th. So if you wanna stay apprised, we're gonna put all the Trump filings and deadlines and oral arguments and all the things on there. And then if the show has to move around because we get, let's say an Arizona indictment, it'll be noted on this calendar. And that way we can all stay in sync. Community calendar is a nice way to stay organized. So you can add this calendar, just click this plus calendar button and it'll add it to your calendar, uh, hopefully. We also have watcherlodge.com. And my friends, this weekend, we have a very, very fun thing happening at watcherlodge.com. Absolutely want to invite you to come and join us. It is free. It's open. Come join us. My mother, Mary Ann, Mama G, Mama Govea is coming by. And she's going to work us through. We're going to see what, what we can squeeze in here. She is amazing with this. But she's doing a purpose and goals workshop. And my mom, as you know, many of you have heard about ericshouse.org and what our family has kind of been through and some of my mom's story. And so we're going to come back on Saturday and unpack our purpose and our goals. And so you can join us for free, watcherlodge.com. My mom's gonna be there. It's gonna be amazing and fun. And we'd love to have you come and join us. It's gonna be exciting. And we're, we're still we're, we're still figuring it out, actually. We're still figuring it out what how the software works, but I can't wait to learn about it with Mama G in the house. So come check it out, watcherlodge.com. It's gonna be fun. All right, now, without any further ado, my friends, let's get to it. We've got some business to attend to, starting with Fanny. Fanny Willis, accused of witness tampering and perjury. We've all suspected it, but we're hearing it from a defendant now. His name is Robert Cheely, and this was a filing that he submitted via his attorney into the court right before Judge McAfee is apparently going to be issuing his ruling. So that is coming any day now, and we have replies, responses, filings coming in, because remember, that we covered another filing from Fannie Willis, which was her supplemental brief after the hearing. And she said that the evidentiary standard is very high and the burden of proof is very high. And so now the defendants are responding. And in this one, we have some pretty serious allegations, of course. Not only was there a conflict, an appearance of a conflict and an actual conflict, but there's also tampering and perjury that was committed, new crimes in this courtroom. So Robert Cheely, if you don't remember him, he is an attorney in Georgia. He appeared on behalf of the Trump campaign and on behalf of the the efforts, let's say, to have an investigation, a thorough investigation brought in 2020 after we saw what happened in Georgia. And we covered that here on this channel. We were here wrapping up the 2020 election coverage. Also, wow. Trump cleaned the clean house. A pretty nice. Have, good night, everybody. Congratulations. Well done. And we turn out the next morning we see that in Fulton County there was a water main break. Huh? At the stadium. Weird. Even the news anchors were like, "A water main break." Really? Okay. I guess I'll report it. <laughs> and then we wake up the next morning and whoop, 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 whoop. You know, Donald Trump is now leapfrogged by Joe Biden. Give me a break. All right. So this guy was doing his due diligence investigating. Of course, Fannie has charged him and everybody with made up crimes. And so now he is responding to this. 
saying, hey, Fannie, not only was there a conflict, this entire indictment was born out of a corrupt appointment of your lover, first of all, but now you committed new crimes and you should be investigated for those. Here is the filing. In Fulton County, Big Fanny Willis, as the prosecutor, gets hit with a response by Robert David Sheely, an attorney in Georgia. He says he's responding to Fanny's post-hearing supplemental brief, and we've got a nice one. It's filed in Fulton County. It's a 20-pager. Let's see what's inside. He tells us in an in introduction, he says, all right, guess what? We're here. Robert David Sheely files his response to Fanny's post hearing supplemental brief. So we were at the evidentiary hearing. We had Adam Abate read us his PowerPoint slides like next slide. It was ridiculous. And then they said, well, we have a bunch of other things we want to say because that was so terrible. Our you know, eyeballs were falling out of our heads. So they submitted a supplemental brief. We read through the full thing here. And essentially, quick recap, but Fanny said that there needs to be an actual conflict of interest and that actual conflict of interest has to be essentially be pecuniary, you know, meaning it relates to money, and it has to essentially be in the outcome of the case, like only in the conviction. So you're like, wow, all those requirements, like we have to hit all those boxes in order to disqualify you? Obviously, that's ridiculous. You know, it's like the highest standards. You can only disqualify us if she had an affair with Nathan Wade on Mars. Yeah, the planet. Well, no, that didn't happen. Well, that's what the case law says. Okay, Adam, sit down. So, you know, it's like a nonstop thing with him. Then in order, it, once those are the defined elements, the next question is, what is the burden of proof? It, is it clear and convincing evidence? Is it preponderance of the evidence? Is it beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest standard? Where is it? So now they're responding to those arguments. So here they tell us, they hit Fanny with a dictionary, okay? They pull it off, off the Webster's, you know, it's not Webster's, it's Black's Law Dictionary, which is about just as big. And they say, here you go, Fanny, here's a dictionary for you, read this. They say Black's Law Dictionary, and that's the name of it, you know, just to be ultra clear on that. It's called Black's Law Dictionary. Black's Law Dictionary helpfully defines a conflict of interest as a real or seeming incompatibility between one's private interests and this doesn't mean genitals. I know we're talking about Fanny, but you know, there's a lot of double meanings here. Or, and one's public or fiduciary duties. Okay, so let's try this again. Black's Law Dictionary says, it is a conflict of interest, a real or seeming incompatibility between one, one's private interests, not one's privates, one's private interests, and one's public or fiduciary duties. All right, got that. Black's Law Dictionary, okay, from 2019. And it's not a racist dictionary, okay? It's not. It's the name of the book. This is in law libraries all over the place. It's not racist or cultural appropriation, okay? It's not. It's not. They say the Fulton County DA has improperly financially benefited, Fanny, improperly financially benefited from the contracts, from the investigation, and the prosecution of this case that the DA awarded to her romantic lover, Nathan Wade, under the cover of night, which we saw. The cell phone records prove that, baby. He got the phone call. He hops in there. There's a fanny call. He's racing down there to Robin Yurdy's condo on the phone the whole time, paying off the cell towers. <laughs> he shows up there. He definitely doesn't lay his head down to rest, not for a minute, because they must be in the kitchen or whatever on the couch but he, he never stayed the night over there. Then he leaves four in the morning, goes back home, sends the, I love you, baby, I'm home safe. Hope you have you know, a good day today, text. We know, under the cover of night, yeah. Robin Yurdy, the condo owner, testified that DA and Wade, they began a romantic relationship in 2019. This is confirmed by the many text messages that we also saw from Terrence Bradley, that guy who lied on the stand multiple times. The incontrovertible cellular telephone records that we saw, as well as the proffered testimony of Cobb ADA Cindy Yeager. Okay, a lot of names there, but we remember Terrence Bradley. Remember, he was the one who was trying to draw a very fine line between bro talk and pro talk. He said everything was pro talk. Judge said, no, it's not. Actually, that's a lot of bro talk there. So you got to talk about that. They brought him back out there and he, he basically doubled down on his, it was speculation, I don't recall. His text messages said the exact opposite, as we know. 
cell phone records we talked about. Cobb was the newest DA who said that she also talked. The Cindy Yeager was the Cobb County DA, a prosecutor, just like Fannie, who was in another county over, who said that Terrence Bradley showed up in her office and she heard a phone call from Fannie to Terrence that said, they're coming after us, you don't have to talk. Okay. Now, after all that happened, now two years later, in November 2021, the DA, Fanny hired Wade. At no time then or since until forced by the current motions, shout out to Ashley Merchant, who blew the lid off this whole thing. Set did the DA at no time then or since until forced to by the current motions, did the DA or Wade disclose their relationship? No. Instead, they conducted themselves in secret as Wade lavished the Fanny with financial benefits derived from Fulton County and from Georgia taxpayers. Wade has since received hundreds of thousands of dollars from three different contracts with Fulton County that are directly related to this prosecution, footnote one. Saying, and by the way, this amount does not reflect any income that Wade received from contracts held by his partners, which he admitted to benefiting from after also splitting the profits with them. We go back, they tell us. The DA Fanny also in turn has benefited to the tune of at least $17,000 in the form of vacations paid for by Wade, plus an unknown additional amount for numerous dinners and day trips. So it appears, says Chile's defense, that funds that came from Fulton County and from Georgia taxpayers we strangely found their way to various hotels and to airlines and to restaurants all for Fannie's financial benefit. They say, <clears throat> as lawyers, they say, hold on a minute. The technical term for that scenario is an actual conflict of interest, Fannie. Now compounding the conflict of interest, neither Fannie or Wade disclosed their relationship or the related financial benefits. In fact, they did everything possible to conceal those problematic details until Ashley Roman, Ashley Merchant and Mike Roman, until their disqualification motions forced them to respond. And even then, even then, Fannie and Wade only cryptically acknowledged their, quote, personal relationship, as we know, meaning indicting each other, saying it began at an undefined point in 2022. Yeah, right and boldly maintain that the DA received no funds or no personal financial gain from Wade. Even Stevens, I paid cash with everything, you know? And furthermore, the DA twice falsely certified that she had received no gift or benefits despite knowing full well that Wade was a literal prohibited person that she had in fact received gifts and benefits from. She lied about it on her public disclosure forms. Now, doubling down on their deceptive filing and their false certifications, and it really is a double down. I mean, if they would have, honestly, if they would have just come out and said, hey, at the very beginning, yes, look, we were both judges. We had our robes on. Our emotions got the better of us. We just got done watching Judge Judy and we were all fired up. Rah! So we were, you know, we couldn't keep our hands. Up. Okay, fine, whatever. It's like, all right. Now, still corrupt, still a conflict, still a problem, still, you know, really, really unbecoming behavior of a DA and her special prosecutor and all that. But the lies on top of it and then the lies on top of the lies is like we're like inception layers of lies now. It's like, oh, my goodness, I can't keep track of it. There's a lot going on, but that is compounding this. And they just even brought Terrence Bradley out like a, a second time and he did it again. So the DA and Wade said they provided false testimony, okay, to this court to cover their tracks. They had a personal interest in the cover-up and they lied to do it. They, let's go through it, they say. Starting with Wade, he maintained the veracity of prior sworn filings that conveyed he never entertained other partners beside his wife. Remember that Nathan Wade filled out the interrogatories with his wife. He was going through a divorce at the time. Well, he got the contract from Fannie on November 1st, filed for divorce November 2nd, the next day, once he had his sugar mama lock him up 
a $700,000 contract in Fulton County. He says, so long, Joycelyn. Nice couple decades of being married to you. Thanks for helping raise the kids. I'm out of here. One day after the contract. Okay. Then while they're still married, he's an attorney so smart that he got the special counsel position. He gets asked specifically, are you married? Have you had interrelationships? Like big paragraph, not like, are you married? Like however you define it today. Are you married? Do you feel like you're married in your heart, Nathan? No, it's like a legal form. Are you, you know, you're married. Did you have inner indictments with this person? And he's like, no, I didn't. He knows what he was doing. He was lying. And then he maintained that lie in court, right? So he lied once and then lied again. Now, Wade has been legally married for decades. And he admits to paying the DA to vacation with him on numerous instances, bringing his Fanny all over the place. And Wade also insisted that Fanny paid him back in cash or in kind to divide expenses, quote, roughly evenly. Mm -hmm. He then conveniently explained that he never deposited any of that cash so that no records could corroborate any reimbursement. And finally, Wade then again falsely testified to minimize the impact of their relationship on this case that he visited Fanny's condo no more than 10 times. But that's not true. Cell phone records reveal that he visited her dozens of times before that date in just the first 11 months of 2021 before they even say that there was a relationship. Remember, they said it started in 2022. Now, they, here, they say, take a look at the redacted records that we've already filed, cell phone records that came in. Now, as for Fanny, writes the defense for Chile, she also maintained that her romantic relationship with Wade began in early 2022. Now, this is even though the aforementioned cell phone records reveal a scandal in the Fanny household. Numerous late night and early morning rendezvous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were rendezvousing between her and Wade. Fanny further claimed to have only, quote, repaid Wade in cash and that she had this cash stored in her home for years. Yeah, and they say, hey, by the way, you know, that's an interesting thing. They say some federal courts, just so you know, Fanny, like this case, U.S. government versus $37,000 in U.S. currency, Second Circuit case decided 1990. They say, note that in some federal courts, they suggest the possible existence of a rebuttable presumption that the possession of a large amount of cash is per se evidence of illegal activity. Hmm. Wonder if Fanny, the so-called prosecutor, knows about that. You have a large amount of cash, you can rebut the presumption, right? The presumption is that it's illegal because why else would you have a huge chunk of cash? And, uh, and she said, well, it's rebuttable. I have this because I'm saving for my husband a new car. Here it is. Or I'm going on a cruise to Napa Valley with my illegally appointed lover. And that's why. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that's not a crime. Maybe it is. So all of this continues with Chile's defense. They say, however, you know, Fanny though, she claimed at times she only had to, you know, about $500 to $1,000 in her cash stash, in her hoard. What'd you call me? Your cash hoard. <laughs> Give me the documents. We remember Fanny. No, it, you, no, no, I didn't call you anything. It's, it's a H-O-A-R-D, hoard. Or, or H-O-R-D-E. I think you could spell it both ways. It has two meanings. Far less than the, than the few thousand that she claimed to have repaid Wade, and even farther less than half the more 17,000 that Wade contributed to her. Toward the clandestine relationship. Not even including the many, many dinners and day trips. We all know where they like to go. Moreover, Fanny failed to present any documentary evidence supporting these fantastical claims, and they are fantastical, $17,000. She reimbursed him from getting those, you know, uh, $40. Would you like cash back with that? She's like, yeah, I got to pay my lover back. How much can I get? She's like, I don't know, $40 is our limit. She's like, well, that's a start. I'll take it. Thanks. Stuffs it somewhere. I don't know. 
So they say no, no, no evidence at all, other than these, other than her own word to support these fantastical claims, other than a receipt, a single receipt for a plane ticket. Wow. The only explanation that Fanny gave for the source of this cash was at times getting $15 cash back when making purchases at the grocery store. Probably when she was buying Grey Goose, you know? She likes the goose. No, 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 she doesn't drink that garbage, okay, that the peasants drink. Grey Goose, top shelf. It's like, want cash back with that? Yeah, I need, I need $50. All right. But then again, the DA provided zero credit card statements. So let us see all of those cash withdrawals. No debit card statements or any other documentary support for this specious claims. So they continue from the defense. They say dissatisfied with merely perjuring themselves. One crime isn't enough. They got to continue this whole charade, which we watched in real time. Fanny and Wade engaged in a coordinated campaign in addition to tamper with a witness. Whew, yeah, they did. And to encourage the witness to present false testimony. That's Terrence Bradley. Now, specifically, Cindy Lee Yeager, who is a co-chief deputy DA for Cobb County, another prosecutor, right? So this is, I mean, this is how crazy this is. Another prosecutor in a, another county, separate and apart from Fanny, is, is the witness who's going to be the one behind this. Says, the office told counsel for Chile, that's the attorney writing this document, that Fannie called Terrence Bradley in September of 2023 and said, quote, they are coming after us. Fannie's on the phone. Hey, Terrence, they are coming after us. You don't need to talk to them about anything about us. They are coming after us. Now, Yeager, this prosecutor, who's you know, sworn to be a prosecutor, uphold the law, pursue justice, all the stuff. She hears Terrence Bradley right up on the stand and she's like, whoa, man, that dude, that dude was saying a bunch of stuff that I know is not true because she had a meeting with him. So Jaeger, the prosecutor, filed that affidavit and that came in from David Schaefer. Now, Mr. Bradley, Terrence, he also testified that another attorney called Gabe Banks, who we heard from at one of these early hearings, Gabe Banks, who is a friend and former Fulton County prosecutor who worked with Fannie Willis and whose wife, Gabe Banks' wife, currently works with Fannie. So Terrence Bradley gets a call from Gabe Banks and from Fannie herself, right? Fanny calls and then Fanny's employee's husband calls. And there was another person who calls as well. Terrence Bradley gets a call and I got, I can't, you know, I can't emphasize this enough. Like Fanny's, you know, I, I, I would imagine that many of you probably share my same opinion of the Fulton County DA's office, right? It's kind of a joke and Fanny has turned it into a joke. I'm sure there are good prosecutors there who probably are sick and disgusted by this. But, but her office and the handling of this case, we've been calling it a joke for months now. In fact, even when they took the plea deals with Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis, and the other two, we were calling it a joke and a laughing stock at that point because they were diversion deals. They didn't get any convictions at all. We're like, what the heck are they even doing here? So it, it's a joke, right? Like her office is a joke. She's kind of a joke. We've seen her come out. She tried to put Harrison Floyd back in custody. We saw her arguments. I was, what is she even doing here? It looked pathetic, honestly. This is before the affair was even a known thing. We were, we were just criticizing her work. It's terrible. And now, in addition to this, it's all corrupt. But it, she is still the DA, okay? I don't want to undermine that in any way. She is still the DA. She's the county attorney for Fulton. That is such a powerful position. I can't, I can't underemphasize that enough. And you look around in your state, right? We often are concerned about like our governor, and maybe the secretary of state's important for elections and you know but the next person that you care really about is the county attorney they have a ton of power not only criminally but civilly in many places they it's it's a huge position and take a look at your budgets right county attorneys like usually top three so it's a big deal when they call you and they say you don't need to talk to them about anything about us right that is like a, an insane thing for a county attorney to do 
She, I guarantee they, they, their office has prosecuted people for statements like that. You don't need to talk to them about anything about us. Oh, talk about what? Talk about what? Your drug sales? Talk about what? That house you burglarized? Whatever, right? All day. So it's really damning. And it's coming from another prosecutor. This isn't like some Trump you know, attorney. This is a prosecutor in Cobb. So they're bringing this out now saying, look, called him in advance of his testimony. They're coming after us. Shut your mouth. And Mr. Bradley then took the stand, he's freaked out, disclaimed any personal knowledge of the relationship between Fannie and Wade. Nope, no idea. Never heard about any of that. And it's all attorney-client privilege. Even though he had previously conveyed such knowledge to counsel for Roman, which is Ashley Merchant, texting her all day, duh, 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 all, you know, all over the place logged. And now Cobb County, a, another prosecutor, Miss Yeager, two of them, now are in here explaining they tell us, so, okay, you know, all right, Judge McAfee, listen, when faced with a mountain of evidence revealing obvious conflicts of interest and a receipt of improper benefits, Fannie and Wade, after we all knew it, they elected not to produce any meaningful evidence to the contrary. You know, they had all the records. They could have shown us. Yeah, it's 50-50. Fannie kept the spreadsheet. It's all, you know, even Stevens. There are no bank statements indicating even a single cash deposit by Wade, not one or a withdrawal by Fannie Willis. Not one, even though each of them controls their own respective bank accounts. And in fact, we were here when they submitted Fannie's calendar events. And we made a mockery of those stupid calendar events because she showed up at 1130, had lunch with her boyfriend at, at an anti-corruption meeting, got an award for some child victim thing, and then went to the 100 day celebration in the afternoon. That was her full day of work. <laughs> like, what's going on over there? And her, the anti-corruption meeting was with her boyfriend and she had other Zoom meetings that she just probably hopped on there with her camera off. You know, it's like, oh gosh, uh, they're in big trouble. So even with all of that, nothing, right, was no evidence. They could have gotten some evidence if they could disprove this. But when, as here, someone has evidence, as the rules say, when someone has evidence in their power and within their reach, this is the rules, that he or she can use to repel a claim and they, it's a get or charge against them, but if they omit it, if they omit to produce it, or they produce evidence that's weaker or inferior, then a presumption arises that the charge or claim against that party is well-founded, right? If you can just disprove this with, you know, a simple photo or something, then that's easy, right? You just, hey, here's the claim, here's the photo, Clearly the photo shows that's not that. You don't have a photo. There's some interesting, you know, ways you can go with this. A lot of conversations about photos, you know, these days as well. So any presumption regarding reimbursement then must lie against Fannie and Wade. They said that they have cash deposits. They haven't shown us a single receipt, a single deposit slip. Do they not have access to their bank accounts? Weird. So if they can't even show you that, then you got to hold it against them. So that brings us, they say, to the state's post-hearing supplemental filing. And we read through this full briefing here. If you missed that and you want to see more what's of what was filed by Fannie, that, of course, is here on our channels. So that supplemental filing, it boldly proclaims that, Fannie argues, one, the defendants bear the burden of proving their claims. And remember, we said uh, by a high standard of proof, which must be more than preponderance of the evidence and that an actual conflict of interest must be shown to disqualify an elected Fanny. Now, sandwiched between these two dubious propositions are bungled arguments attempting to analogize both post-conviction review of disqualification rulings and distinguished citations that were cited by the defense. So they packed a lot in here. In here. So they're going to go after now Fanny's original response. And... We had previously talked about really the three standards of evidence that are most pertinent to our conversation here, which is preponderance of the evidence, which is, as we say in the law, like 51%. If it's more likely than not, cop says, hey, I think you're going 10 over. You think I you say, I know I'm not. Judge says, well, it's, it's uh, more likely that you were. He's certified. You're not. 51%. He gets the victory. You get the ticket. Okay. Preponderance of the evidence. Now, this is what Trump really wants. The next one would be we call clear and convincing evidence which is splitting the of this and the highest one, which would be beyond a reasonable doubt, which is where you hear in the show all the time, you know, on TV shows all the time, beyond a reasonable doubt. 
And so that's, think about like, you know, more 80 to 90%. I'd say, you know, even higher than that, but you'll hear a prosecutor say 80. So somewhere in between. Now, Trump's team wants to push this down as far as possible. They want to keep it near like 51%. Hey, look, it's a prosecutor, okay? They're supposed to be way above uh, reproach. And if they're even close to this, it should be a low standard. It would just tripwire, tip it over. If it's more likely than not that Fannie was indicting Wade, well, got to go. Now, the government's going to say it's much higher than that, right? It should be like 80 to 90%, like a criminal trial. They're not going to use that phrase because that's the highest, but they'll say higher than that. All right. So that's that. Now, also an actual conflict and that they, the, the, the case law was bad. All right. So as explained further, they'll tell us the state exploits a single reference to one phrase that they want that higher standard of proof. And it transmogrifies it into some high evidentiary bar. So they went through, they found some case law that says we have to have, if you're disqualifying prosecutors, a high standard of proof. Okay, what does that mean? But even if the state is correct, they say, the movements, them, they have nonetheless proved an actual, con or, uh, the, the defense, the, the Trump people, proved an actual conflict by clear and convincing evidence, even though the actual burden is an appearance of impropriety by a preponderance of the evidence, right? So they're saying, look, e look, Fannie is saying it should, you know, they, they didn't really tell us in their argument that they want clear and convincing evidence, but that's kind of the next logical step, right? They're not, they, they're not arguing for beyond a reasonable doubt. That's criminal code. That's a whole separate thing, but, or a separate concept, right? It's a separate set of penalties, but it's also, it's all in the burden of proof, you know, hierarchy then clear and convincing evidence. So they really want that. But Trump is saying, okay, look, first of all, that's not the standard. We agree that it's 51% preponderance of the evidence. But if it were clear and convincing, we would meet that standard easily because there is an actual conflict. So even if it was actual conflict plus clear and convincing, we still win. So they say, let's turn to the legal standard and get clarity on this because Fannie spent a lot of time on this. They say, first of all, Fannie and her insistence that only an actual conflict, you know, where it's actually a problem, requires disqualification is an ineffective appeal to the lowest common denominator. Now that standard, the state thinks, provides just enough cover to skate past the disqualification here. If we use that standard, Fannie stays on the case. They say no, not quite though. No Georgia court has ever held that an actual conflict of interest is required for disqualification saying the state counters this, they say, well, you know, no court has ever expressly held that an appearance of a conflict or impropriety alone, absent an actual conflict, is enough to justify the disqualification. But many disqualification fe cases feature actual conflicts, but neither has any Georgia court held that an apparent conflict alone is not enough to warrant a disqualification. In fact, Georgia courts have acknowledged the very possibility. So a lot of words around what the court is saying about the, what does it take ultimately, right? What are the check boxes that they need to hit in order to disqualify? And this is how the law works. There's a lot of different courts kind of talking about it, but talking, you know, kind of aside each other and they're trying to smash it all into one. So they say, but this is what they want. They say, this is no surprise. They say it's old, well-established maxim of law that an appearance of evil, just the appearance of evil, is as much to be abhorred as the evil itself. Hmm. 1977 case. To be sure about that principle, Judge McBurney also explained this. There was a prior order that disqualified Fannie. And in McBurney's order, disqualifying Fannie in another situation, he said a mere appearance of impropriety is generally not enough to support disqualification, except in the rarest of cases, meaning he agrees. Yet this is one of those cases, is what he said. Now, but even if the court disagrees and elects to apply an actual conflict versus an appearance standard, so what are the rules and then what are the standards? What's the burden of proof? What are the rules? What are the elements? And then how do you get there? This is also a case where the conflict is actual. It's not just an appearance, it's actual. And it's palpable. Ugh. It's not speculative and it's not remote. So either way, the defense have satisfied whatever legal standard the court applies. We don't care. They do. They want the lower standard because it's easier to disqualify her. But 
they'll meet the high standard too because this is one of the most egregious cases ever. Now, lastly, they say the state inaptly relies on post-conviction disqualification decisions. And we made a lot of criticisms about this when we were reading Fanny's response. They kept digging into post-conviction cases after the case was closed, right? After the case is over, they have a trial, somebody's convicted, they have sentencing, that person's gone. There's a whole series of, you know, of case, cases and precedent called post-conviction relief. And there's different standards because, you know, this happens a lot, right? Everybody loses their trial. Then they say, oh, my lawyer was bad. Well, you, you said he did a great job when you were sitting next to him. And as soon as you lose, he was terrible. Ineffective assistance of counsel. I got railroaded, all the things, right? It, it happens a lot. So they have, you know, different set of rules. Okay, well, you got to show that it's manifest injustice and this happened. Very high standards. So it's, it's very difficult after the conviction to reopen a case. It's like done, like you had your shot. Didn't like your attorney then, should have made, you know, made it known. But once it's all done and closed, it's the, high, the standard becomes very high. And of course, that's what Adam and Fanny, they went and got all those cases. They're like, well, this one's related and this one's related and this one's related, all extremely high standards. They say, lastly, they use those and then they hypocritically attempt to distinguish dozens of other decisions that we cited. So they go get a bunch of garbage cases and they get rid of ours and shove theirs in. Now to start, they say appellate courts in Georgia reviewing disqualification rulings after a conviction necessarily did not apply the same standards as trial courts do in the first instance. When you come, when you're, you know, before the conclusion of the trial, it's a different standard. Now the state says that any case involving conflicts that's attributable to private counsel did not apply to the disqualification of a constitutional officer, right? And Fanny's apparently one of those. Now, yet the state itself cites numerous decisions involving pri private counsel when it suits. So they're just picking and choosing cases. They also knock the applicability of this case and they re rely on this case, which are very similar. But also in that case, they failed to produce any evidence. And so we're just distinguishing cases and that can get tedious. So we jump forward to the legal standard. And we spent a lot of time on this in Georgia during the summation arguments, back during Judge McAfee's court proceedings. And I think he's grappling with a lot of this right now. Here's what the defense says. Administration of the law should be free from all temptation and suspicion so far as human agency is capable of accomplishing this object, 1852. Courts, therefore, have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted within the ethical standards of the profession and that legal proceedings appear fair to all who observe them. It's a very important part of our judicial system. In fact, arguably the strongest mechanism of our enforcement system, of the justice system, is its legitimacy. That's how it enforces anything. It's because people think it's legitimate. If every single person just didn't show up to court, that's kind of it. But we all do, because we all think it's legitimate. Now, when assessing potential bias or conflict, our system of law has always endeavored to prevent, quote, even the probability of unfairness. Get rid of it. 1982 case. So with that in mind, the issue of attorney disqualification is a continuum. On one end, if we plotted this on a spectrum, disqualification is always justified and it's even mandated when, quote, the appearance of impropriety is coupled with a conflict of interest. Ooh, good case. Now, somewhere in the middle of the continuum, on the one hand, if you have an appearance of impropriety and an actual conflict, gotta go. In the middle, the appearance of improprieties based on conduct on the part of the attorney generally has been found to be insufficient for disqualification of a private attorney in a civil context. Okay, so civil lawyer, not a criminal case. He did something bad. Do you disqualify him? Maybe not automatically. So they say thus it would be paradoxical if disqualification of Fanny, who is subject to the higher standard, of public trust, right? So she is supposed to be even more uh, beyond reproach. 
more trustworthy, more honorable, more integrity than anybody in the entire Fulton County. Public trust of a public prosecutor. It required a higher standard of proof than disqualification of a private attorney in a civil context. And finally, they're giving us some case law. For both prosecutors and for private counsel, the appearance of impropriety based not on conduct but on status alone is also insufficient for disqualification. But in the present case, the defense most certainly is not seeking disqualification simply based on her status. So that case is not important. Rather, the disqualification motions target the improper conduct of the DA. So they're citing the status stuff. We're talking about her conduct. And they tell us, in sum, disqualification based on appearance alone, while it's rare and often insufficient in a civil context, it's still permissible when a prosecutor is involved, just on an appearance alone. That's because prosecutors are required to stand aside for the sake of public confidence in the probity of the administration of justice, and private lawyers are not. Right? Public prosecutors, they're servants, they tell us. <laughs> As such, when a prosecutor's participation could even, quote, cast doubt on the fairness of the trial, disqualification might be appropriate. Georgia case, 2021. No Georgia court has ever held that an actual conflict is necessary to disqualify a prosecutor, but that's what Adam Abate says. They continue, telling us that the state's opening gambit in their case is to insist that Trump and the defense and Chile and Mike Roman, that they bear the burden of proving their claims, but why they call is a high standard of proof, right? We don't know what it is exactly which necessarily must be more than preponderance of the evidence, which is the lowest. And it must be higher than that. It makes this claim based on one sentence that they cobbled out of this case. The court said that it has a role, its role in addressing attorney misconduct and in holding those who allege such, mis such misconduct to a high standard of proof. So they capitalized on that line. That case cites another case, which just says that the standard to recover damages for defamation is clear and convincing showing of actual mal of malice, which is a high standard of proof. So it's a defamation case. So then the state cites three other decisions that recognize the same thing. And then they proceed to invoke a host of unpublished 11th Circuit decisions for the unremarkable proposition that preponderance of the evidence is not a high standard of proof. Okay, it's great, it's all defamation cases. But McGlynn, however, is not the smoking gun that they think it is. McGlynn involved post-conviction review of a defendant's bid to get rid of the DA. So after this person was already convicted, then they said, well, now I should get rid of that person and do this whole thing over again. And it did not even implicate a conflict of interest at all. Rather, the defendant in that case that they're leaning on, it argued that a prosecutor's discussion with the witness before the trial ultimately resulted in the witness's decision on the advice of his own counsel to invoke the fifth. And that discussion, according to the defendant, violated his due process rights, which again, there's no conflict there. But there was no suggestion of any conflict of interest. Instead, the court held that the record did not establish any sanctionable conduct on the part of the ADA. ADAs talk to people all the time. Nothing in McGlynn sheds light on the present conflict-based disqualification. So this case is not pertinent. Thanks, Adam. Sit down. And random decisions invoking a generic phrase that they just pull out of their fanny, they say like a high standard of proof. And where did that come from? Outside of the disqualification context are irrelevant. They say, here, we just went on our, our digital search engine called Westlaw. And we typed in high standard of proof in quotes. And that brings up 14 Georgia decisions. Some of those involve defamation. That's why they got Terrell and others pertain to proving intellectual disability in the criminal sentencing context. Now, so what do we make of that? He asks a question. What do we make of this? Others involve municipal liability. Huh. So high standard of proof for what? Municipal liability. Uh, we've got defamation cases. Why is he bringing out all these cases? Like, why don't you go get like a divorce case? Uh -huh. Why don't you go get a traffic ticket case? Go get one of those. Right? It, it, in other words, it's not a standard in the law. They're just kind of making it up because they don't have a standard. They say, so what do we make of all this? Well, not much at all. Quote, high standard of proof is a common phrase employed in all manner of context to signify a wide variety of standards. 
So it doesn't mean anything. Kind of means everything and nothing. So no Georgia court then has ever employed the phrase, quote, high standard of proof. Where did Adam get that from? Fanny, tell him. Uh, just go tell him it's a high standard of proof. Like, Fanny, no, it's not real. Do it. No. Ah. And no Georgia court has ever employed the clear and convincing standard when assessing a conflict of interest. So their standard at the higher standard, or at the one in the middle, is wrong. Now, indeed, no Georgia court has ever suggested that anything more than a preponderance of the evidence, the low standard, is required for disqualification. If a court had said as much, if they had said that, then the state would surely bring that to its, uh, our court's attention. But guess what? They haven't. Instead, Fannie and her office, they go and they cite a post-conviction review of an ersatz disqualification argument based on the alleged prosecutorial misconduct with a witness that resulted in a witness invoking the fifth. If that glaringly in opposite decision, in other words, this doesn't apply, if it is the state's best authority, then that is evidence enough that no Georgia court has ever disclaimed a preponderance of the evidence standard when assessing a conflict of interest. So they say it's never been a process, it's never been a preponderance of the evidence standard, blah, blah, blah. And they say no. No court has ever disclaimed that, right? Saying you can't use that standard, which means if no court has said that you can't use it, then you can use it. They continue telling us that aside from advancing an inflated evidentiary standard into the disqualification analysis, Fannie in her office. They, oh man, Fanny, she sneaks, seeks to smuggle in an, an exaggerated legal standard as well. Specifically, Fanny contends that multiple Georgia Supreme Court cases clearly establish that Georgia trial courts are not authorized to disqualify elected DAs, absent an actual conflict, saying an appearance is insufficient. And those cases include these, they all cited. But they say, first of all, they gave you a lot of cases, Judge McAfee, and Judge McAfee is going to be very irritated about this. He's not going to be happy about that. They cited Lee versus State, Blumenfeld, Lyons, Lamb, Williams, 1988. None of these cases, though, they say, none of them hold what Fanny says they do. They give us a breakdown. They say this first one, Lee versus State, it involves post-conviction. Again, we're not in post-conviction world right now. We're in pre-conviction land. This is all in progress right now. It is a totally in opposite fact pattern. Doesn't have anything to do with this case. There, a defendant said that a prosecutor should have been disqualified because of previous representation. But the defendant identified no evidence on the record that the DA actually represented him in a prior case or had any knowledge. And so therefore the court affirmed the denial of the disqualification because there was nothing done here. Now, nowhere in this opinion does the court hold that the burden was by clear and convincing evidence. Nowhere. By contrast, no movement in the pre present case before you, Judge McAfee, has been convicted. That case involved a convicted person. No one has been convicted here. Defendants have produced a mountain of evidence demonstrating a conflict, and no defendant bears the burden of proving error by the appellate record. To the extent the court mentioned the lack of an actual conflict, in that case, that language must be understood in the post-conviction context, where the only thing alleged was an actual conflict due to prior representation. It does not mean that disqualification for an apparent conflict would have constituted an abuse of discretion. So that case is totally inapplicable. Another one of Adam's crap cases, called Blumenfeld, describes general disqualification standards, but is of exceedingly limited utility here. Because in that case, the focus was on the status of counsel, not on their conduct. That case was a probate action. Supreme Court said other things. But the state is subject to higher standards than private lawyers in a civil case. And no defendant is advocating a status-based disqualification. So again, it's not on point. It's of no use in the present case because it's distinguishable. Adam tried another one with Fanny. These cases are also useless here because they involve convicted defendants who also raised ineffective assistance of counsel claims, right? I lost my trial. My attorney was terrible. So we have now to, you know, reopen the case. 
In Lamb, I want a new trial. The defendant argued that his trial and his lawyers were ineffective because he says there were conflicts. What were the conflicts? The trial attorney and his associate both represented the defendant's brother as another co-defendant in another criminal case, totally unrelated. And the court said, well, there's no actual conflict here. Like, what's the conflict? But where did that actual conflict originate? And they took it out from the Sixth Amendment. But no defendant here has raised Sixth Amendment claims. So these decisions, again, are inapplicable. So what those cases were decided on don't apply here. And lastly, finally, they give us some examples where other disqualification was appropriate. They say in particular, in these other cases, the court said a conflict of interest has been held to rise where the prosecutor previously has represented the defendant with respect to the offense charge. Now, the state took this decision and construed these examples as being exhaustive. But of course, the, the court did not say that. And here in this case, the defendants contend that Fannie and Wade, they have a personal interest or stake. We do, in fact, contend they have a stake in this prosecution. Why? Because Fannie has improperly benefited personally from this. She has had a financial largesse. That's true. She did have a fa financial largesse. That's true. Bestowed on her by Wade. Now, the state quibbles that an interest in this case is distinct from an interest in a conviction, right? So Adam came out and he said, no, 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 no. They're not interested in a prosecution financially, which is obviously ridiculous from day one. Because if Wade didn't indict them, well, there'd be no contract. What would the contract be for? To investigate them and then dismiss it? Obviously, it was to indict them. And then the renewals of the contract were to continue with the prosecutions. So if, if Nathan would have told Fannie, sweetheart, I love you, but I can't do this. All right. This is crazy, Doc. All of it would have gone away and she wouldn't have had extra money from Wade to go on her cruises. So they say, obviously, this is splitting hairs. It's not about the conviction. While neither Fannie or Wade will receive a bonus for any convictions, Fannie has inarguably personally benefited financially from her secret romantic entanglement and the money she arranged to be paid to Wade. And they continue telling us that there is an actual conflict and that warrants disqualification saying the state itself previously has acknowledged in this very case, Fanny said this, that prosecutors are held to higher standards than their counterparts in private practice. In fact, on September 20th, 2023, Fannie's office filed this, a notice of potential conflicts of interest about some defense counsel. The notice submitted by Fannie in relevant part stated that a prosecutor has the responsibility of a minister of justice and not simply that of an advocate. Yeah, right. Minister of justice with your $700,000 to your lover? Give me a break. Now, the notice then went on to boldly emphasize, in light, this is Fannie writing, in light of the prosecutor's public responsibilities, broad authority and discretion, the prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor to the courts and in fulfilling other professional obligations. Big Fanny. Now, giving these lofty principles, which are conspicuously absent from their recent briefing, Fanny professed concerns about the defendant's rights to due process and to a fundamentally fair trial if certain defense counsel were not disqualified given their prior representations. So in other words, Fanny submitted this and said, Your Honor, some of these lawyers know each other and this lawyer representing this guy knows this guy and there, there's a conflict here because he knows something about that co-defendant and now he's representing this co-defendant. This is what government does. They try to pit defendants against other defendants, right? So like if this lawyer is representing, you know, like, I'm representing person A, but I had represented person B before and they're co-defendants in this case. Now they might say that I know something about defendant B that I might use to give an inappropriate advantage to defendant A. And so I should be conflicted off because it's even though it's unrelated, they try to make co-defendants work against each other. So that's why it's difficult to have one attorney with two co-defendants because inevitably they're going to pit them against each other and then the attorney's going to have to get off the case because there'll be a conflict of interest. But the point is, 
Fanny submitted that in. Like nobody was complaining about conflicts. And she's like, uh oh, 19 co defendants. There's only so many defense attorneys in Georgia. So there's a lot of overlap there. You guys got to get disqualified. Go find new lawyers. So she was trying to disqualify, you know, good attorneys from the cases. So they say, okay, if she has such a heightened duty that she has to sua sponte on her own, just get out and call the court's attention to this stuff, maybe someone should have called attention to her indictments of her boyfriend. They say, so we'll do that. Now, defendants, all we want to do is hold the state to the standard that they touted only a few short months ago, right? That's their standard. Heightened duty of candor. I love this. So they're just saying, hey, Judge McAfee, they brought this up. They told you in September, right? See how fun this is? They told you in their own filing in September that a prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor to the courts and in fulfilling all of their other professional obligations. Huh. That comes from Fannie Land. Yeah, the notice went on to say all of that. Isn't that amazing? So Fanny will drag that out when it's useful to her and then when she actually needs to obligate herself to that standard, she falls far below it. So how can they tell the court that they have a heightened duty of candor and then lie to the court right to Judge McAfee's face? In addition to the bevy of citations from their prior briefing, the Georgia Supreme Court's decision in Newman illustrates that an actual conflict is not necessary for disqualification at all. The defendant in that case moved to disqualify the entire office of Fannie's for the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit because some prosecutors had read his privileged communications with the attorney. Now, the trial court denied that motion and the Supreme Court in Georgia affirmed. But the court hastened to explain they said the disqualification of the prosecutor's office might be appropriate where the privileged information disclosed to the prosecution was so voluminous that it would cast doubt on the fairness of the trial absent disqualification of the prosecuting attorneys who had reviewed the files. In other words, the standard for disqualification was whether the prosecutor's participation, uh-oh, could cast doubt on the fairness of the trial. And that is totally inconsistent with an actual conflict mandate which doesn't appear anywhere in the court's decision. The doubt cast is consistent, however, with an appearance of impropriety. Doubt cast. Doesn't say actual in indictments of each other. Now, the state also invokes a host of other bad cases. They say no discussion of actual conflict they keep referring to. No discussion of it appears in numerous decisions that they cited. Previously cited by Chile and others. All these cases, boom, 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 all of them, not in there. So to avoid the obvious doctrinal barriers that are impeding the government's preferred standard, Fannie and her office, the state, they hypocritically maintain that the decisions above are just not applicable. They say, well, we found these cases judged. None of them talk about actual conflict at all. They say, well, those aren't applicable. Why, they ask? Well, the state says these decisions, quote, do not apply to the disqualification of a constitutional officer whose loyalty lies with seeking justice, <laughs> not with any individual or private client. Yeah, that's a bold proposition, they say, considering that the state itself cites three decisions involving private counsel. Derp. So it appears that decisions involving private counsel only become relevant when they benefit the state. And that, of course, obviously is nonsense, they say. So given the higher standard of public trust that a prosecutor is to be held, it stands to reason that if private attorneys are subject to disqualification, then prosecutors are as well. Like if it's bad enough that, a, okay, a defense attorney did something bad, you have to go. So a prosecutor does something worse and they get to stay? Uh, no, right? If, if they did that same thing, they get to stay, I guess? Because what, they're prosecutors? No. You have to go because you should know even better. It's like you get punished more because you know better. But that heightened standard to which prosecutors are held also mean that prosecutors may be disqualified even where private attorneys remain. They have more standards than even other attorneys. Now, 
Fannie and her office, they implore the court. They say, ignore this case. And they invoke another decision involving similar circumstances. In the Davenport case, they held the defendant was charged and denied a fundamentally fair trial where the DA previously represented the victim, which was the defendant's husband in a pending divorce case, and was cognizant of information that occurred. And the attorney sat at the counsel's table for the entirety of the trial. Now, according to the state, the facts and the legal principles in Dav Davenport are, are far too remote to be applicable here. So once again, the state gets to invoke any decision that it helps, helps them, and they distinguish away other decisions that go against them. But no, judge, you know better than that. And finally, they invoke this Georgia code, even though it too does not demonstrate that an actual conflict is required. It doesn't say that at all if you read it. And so apparently they are ignoring, they say, Fannie is just ignoring all of her obligations. First of all, Fannie is a public trustee under Georgia law. They say Fannie has forgotten that she, her office, and Wade are, quote, trustees and servants of the people and are at all times amenable to them, Georgia Constitution, that they ripped into shreds. Indeed, as the Georgia Supreme Court has emphasized, a trustee is held to something stricter than the morals of the marketplace. Not honesty alone, but the punctilio, punctilio, word vocab of the day, of an honor, the most sensitive is then the standard of behavior. As to this, there has been developed a tradition that it, it unbending and inveterate. Malcolm versus Webb, 1955. And the most basic rule is that, quote, no public agent or trustee shall have the opportunity to be led into tempta temptation or to make a profit out of others entrusted to their care. Don't take advantage of people. Now, while that may be inconvenient for Fanny, she accepted office. It was not forced upon her. She cannot therefore complain of the disabilities which are incident to it. Can Fanny, her office, and the Wades as public trustees, can they prosecute this case, quote, disinterestedly? Possibly, they may. But the law regarding, regarding our fallen nature as all weak forbids that any temptation be laid in the path of anyone, however exalted their office or pure their character. Telling us that they're hearkening back to standards articulated at the outset. Both unfairness and the appearance of unfairness should be avoided. So, Chile's team continues wrapping up, telling us, so wherever there may be a reasonable suspicion of unfairness, it is best to disqualify. That is the answer here. And for the reasons above, along with those articulated in Chile's initial reply, this court should disqualify Fannie Willis, disqualify her entire office, get rid of Wade and dismiss the entire indictment. Signed by Christopher S. Anilwich and Richard A. Rice Jr. in the house. Nice filing from our friends in Atlanta, Georgia. On behalf of Robert Cheeley and the Big Fanny Willis Rico indictment. And so, this is the response. We're waiting for Fannie Willis replies. We're also waiting for other responses from other co-defendants. And we are going to be here covering all of the filings in the RICO case, of course. We also have some reaction from Representative Senator Reverend Warnock, who is a senator in Georgia. And he got asked about this when he was making the rounds on the media circuits. Here is what the senator from Georgia had to say. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis could be thrown off of Donald Trump's 2020 election interference case in Georgia after admitting that she had that personal relationship with the lead prosecutor, though she argues there was no impropriety. Do you think that relationship undercuts the integrity of the case and should she step down? Listen, we are watching our judicial process play out. And uh, I know that there are folks unfortunately in the state of georgia politicians 
who are trying to put their hand on the scale. I'm not going to pile on. I'm not going to add to that. Uh, I, I, I will watch this process play out, and uh, we will see where the chips fall. But at the end of the day, here's what yeah. Donald Trump deserves. He deserves to have a uh. fair trial before his, a jury of his peers, and in this, is, in this case, as voters of Georgia, and uh, we need to see that play out. And, and given that, do you think that the optics have become so complicated around this that Fonnie Willis should step down for the better good of the case that you Too just talked about? Too late for that. Should have done that a long well, time ago. Uh, uh, listen, I, I think this case is being played out before a judge, and that judge will have to make a decision not based on optics but based on the law. And that's the wonderful thing about America. We believe that no one is above the law, including Donald Trump. Uh, what about Fannie Willis and the illegal immigrants coming across the border? Well, a lot of people are above the law in this country. Just ask Primala Jayapal and Joaquin Castro. No, no one is illegal. No one. All right. So we, we're tired of that trope. Of course, a lot of people are above the law. Joe Biden was, apparently. All you got to be is an elderly old man who doesn't know anything about classified documents. You're good. So the point is, in Georgia, we are waiting patiently for Judge McAfee to issue his ruling. He said it was going to be coming on Friday, and we're going to be here waiting for it to drop, my friends. And so thank you for joining us as we continue to cover not only this Trump trial, but all the rest of them, including the civil matters, the Supreme Court journeys that we're on. We'd love to have you join us here on our channel. Thanks for subscribing wherever it is you're watching it. Thanks for checking out some of the links in the description below. We've got robertcovea.com where we have all of the PDFs uploaded. Our calendar is there. We have watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is our members only community. We do streams in the morning and on Saturday. We'd love to have you join us there. And come to our event, watcherlodge.com. We have an amazing event with my mama coming up. She's gonna come do a workshop on purpose and goals. We'd love to have you join us all free, watcherlodge.com. Check the links out in the description. We'll see you back here on the next one. All right, my friends, we're not done yet. We are now going over to New York and dealing with Bragg because we got a trial coming up right around the corner. Donald Trump is fighting to adjourn his criminal trial that is scheduled for March, March 25th in New York, multiple felonies brought by this guy, Alvin Bragg. And their star witness is Michael Cohen. You remember him, the convicted perjurer who Trump's team says committed perjury again in the Letitia James trial because they're just using this convicted perjurer as a starting point for all of these weaponized prosecutions against Trump. And this one is right around the corner. We know this is Judge Juan Mercan who's presiding over this. And he's explaining that trial is going to be going. This is kind of all hands on deck for the left. They know that the J6 case is not going to likely be happening this year. Florida's probably going to get bumped. Fannie Willis is in trouble indicting her special prosecutor. And now this is all they've got. But Trump submitted a motion to preclude evidence and to adjourn this entire trial because of presidential immunity, because the Supreme Court is hearing that issue. It worked its way up through Judge Chutkin's courtroom on the January 6th proceedings. And now Trump says it applies in this case. Let's get into the filing. We see criminal case against Donald Trump. Supreme Court, state of New York, brag against Donald Trump. The defense, Trump writes the following, this is President Trump's motion to exclude evidence and for an adjournment. Why? Presidential immunity. They give us some background on this. They say, your honors, your honor, Judge Juan Mercan in New York, President Trump respectfully submits this motion for an adjournment of the trial. Why? presidential immunity. We know the Supreme Court is set to review the scope of this and they hear, agreed to hear this case back in February. Oral arguments are going to be on April 25th and we have that on our calendar. So be sure you're subscribed to our calendar at robertgovea.com slash calendar. And two, they're also gonna be considering or ask the court to consider 
whether they can preclude evidence of Trump's official acts at trial based on presidential immunity. So postpone the trial, right? Adjourn the current trial date. And when you're reconsidering this trial date, preclude evidence that is protected via presidential immunity. Here's some more. Trump says, all right, Judge Juan Mercan, who's very adversarial to the defense thus far. All right, Juan, this court must preclude Bragg from offering evidence at trial of Trump's official acts as the commander in chief. Can't talk about that. That's not evidence. Which Bragg have not yet even specified as the existing trial date approaches in just two weeks. However, in motions in limine recently filed, Bragg or argued that they should be permitted to offer evidence at trial concerning a fictitious so-called pressure campaign by Trump in 2018 relating to Michael Cohen. Uh-oh now. Now we're in Trump is president time, right? Clock starts 2017 when Trump is sworn in. Now the people's motion in limine is what references this. So in other words, Bragg is saying, I want to talk about what Trump did in 2018 to pressure Cohen. And they say, "Uh uh-uh, sorry, that's president time. Now, although the people did not describe the evidence that they intend to offer in detail, so we don't even know what they're talking about, it appears that Bragg, that the evidence includes public statements by President Trump and posts to his official Twitter account, as well as testimony from unspecified witnesses. So we don't even know what, what, what it is they want, but apparently it's from his official president stuff. So the people's recent proffer, meaning Bragg, they came in, and they, they told the court what it was going to be used for, but that they can't use it. Sorry, it implicates presidential immunity because Trump was president when he made those statements and did those things in 2018. He made at least some of those 2018 statements at issue and potentially all of them, though it's hard to be sure because we don't even know what they're talking about or what they want, in his official capacity as the chief executive of this country. And moreover, while it's clear that Bragg intends to offer documents and testimony relating to the period of 2017 when Trump was in office, they again have not provided sufficiently specific notice of the nature and the extent of that evidence to allow Trump or the court to distinguish between personal and official acts. So they just say, we've got this evidence we want to use against Trump, came from his Twitter, came from other areas. And Trump says, no, that's all my official stuff, which is the argument that we're making in January 6th case in the J6 case in Chutkin's courtroom. Within the outer perimeter of the official acts, immune. Congress doesn't like it. They can impeach the president, then shatter that immunity and convict them, which they didn't do with Trump. So such distinctions are necessary and complex. We have to get into this. And so we can't have this trial if we don't know what evidence they're using. As illustrated by the D.C. Circuit's recent guidance in Blossing Game, in that case, the panel emphasized that Trump is provided every opportunity he's entitled, every opportunity to present his defense. And this area of law, Judge Juan Mercan in New York, is evolving in real time. So how can we have a trial when we don't even know if some evidence is immune or not? Now, specifically on the 28th this year, SCOTUS granted cert And they're going to answer the following question when they decide. Question, whether and if so, to what extent does former president or former presidents enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? So do you see what Trump is doing? They are sneaking this in, right? We don't know. Alvin Bragg has a bunch of different evidence. We don't know. Some of that official, maybe. Some of it's not, maybe. But we don't know because they're not telling us what it is. So therefore, we can't, have a, we can't have a trial while the Supreme Court is talking about protecting official acts, providing immunity like a force field around them. They say, in addition, Judge Juan, on March 4th, a unanimous Supreme Court also, oh, this hurt for Judge Luddig. Pour one out for Judge Luddig. Sorry, loser. Held that the Colorado Supreme Court had erred by excluding President Trump from the Colorado 2024 presidential primary ballot. Nine to zero. Oops. The Anderson court reasoned, in part, that states power over governance does not extend to federal candidates. 
The court's emphasis on federalism principles further supports the timing of this motion and is relevant to the application of presidential immunity because any effort to retaliate against a president for official acts would be an unconstitutional attempt to influence a sovereign superior exempt from those obstacles, right? If the president is beholden to uh, like the federal courts or suing him to do this or to do that, or a prosecutor is prosecuting him to do this or to do that, then he's kind of subordinate to those people, right? Which is why we have immunity to protect and insulate the office. So therefore they say, President Trump respectfully submits that an adjournment of the trial is appropriate to await further guidance from SCOTUS, which should facilitate the appropriate application of the presidential immunity doctrine, in this case, to the evidence that Bragg intends to offer. Now, after we get the Supreme Court decision and consistent with the remand, the court should hold a hearing outside the presence of this jury to identify and preclude documentary and testimonial official acts evidence that's based on presidential immunity. So some of the stuff that they're seemingly going to introduce is presidential, you know, might be official acts. We don't know. We have to decide. So we have to have a separate evidentiary hearing where we'll present evidence of that and then we'll break it all down. So here's what they give us. Trump's team tells New York judge Juan Mercan that as far as we can gather from the description of Bragg's so-called pressure campaign that he's going to seek to introduce into evidence in their motion, there are several types of evidence that implicate the concept of official acts for the purposes of presidential immunity. If Trump was acting inside the outer perimeter of his official duties, presidential immunity applies to the hula hoop. If he's outside, it doesn't. So they say, well, if that evidence is inside, and we think it is because this is what they've told us. It has to be precluded. If we have trial coming up while SCOTUS is still weighing this, then you can't talk about that because it's, we don't know. It might be legal. Here's what we've got. First, President Trump used his Twitter account, which was an official communications channel during his presidency. And he used that Twitter account to, with, to communicate with the public about matters of public concern. And in 2018, some of those matters included Michael Cohen. FBI executed search warrants that targeted him. In April 2018, President Trump posted messages on his Twitter account. He said the following. He said, quote, Michael's a businessman for his own accountant lawyer who I have always liked and respected. Most people will flip if the government lets them out of trouble, even if it means lying or making up stories. Sorry, I don't see Michael doing that despite the horrible witch hunt and the dishonest media. Trump also said in 2018, May, he said, Mr. Cohen, an attorney, received a monthly retainer, not from the campaign and having nothing to do with the campaign, from which he entered into, through reimbursement, a private contract between two parties known as a non-disclosure agreement. These agreements are very common among celebrities and peoples of wealth. Money from the campaign or campaign contributions, Trump said, played no role in this transaction. All above board, nothing to even worry about here. Leave me alone. On August 22nd, Trump also said on Twitter, he said, you know, I feel very badly for Paul Manafort and his wonderful family. Justice took a 12-year-old tax case, among other things, applied tremendous pressure on him. And unlike Michael Cohen, he refused to break, make up stories in order to get a deal. Such respect for a brave man says Paul, or says uh, Trump on behalf of uh, Paul Manafort. And second, President Trump made public statements on official premises during media appearances. So Trump went out, he said this, April 5th. During statements to reporters on Air Force One, Trump directed reporters, he says, ask Michael Cohen about the allegations. Added, Michael is my attorney. You'll have to ask Michael Cohen. April 26, during a phone call, we got redactions coming up too, ooh, says during a telephone call aired on Fox and Friends, Trump explained that Cohen, quote, has a percentage of my overall legal work, a tiny, tiny little fraction, but Michael would represent me on some things. Like with this crazy Stormy Daniels deal, you know, he represented me. And you know, from what I see, he did absolutely nothing wrong. There were no campaign funds going into this at all. Trump also said on August 23rd, during an interview on Fox and Friends, 
He said, you know, if you look at President Obama, he had a massive campaign violation, but he had a different attorney general and they viewed it a lot differently, you know? We have somebody that they seem to like to go after a lot of Republicans, but he settled his very easily. In fact, I put out, I put that out fairly recently. So Obama had it, other people have it. Almost everybody that runs for office has campaign violations, but what Michael Cohen pled to, they weren't even campaign related. They weren't even crimes. So Trump's defense is pulling those out. They are now saying third. Bragg also seems to want to offer other evidence that reflects official acts. And the category appears to include a form that Trump submitted to the U.S. government office. Fourth, it also appears that they're going to try to elicit testimony at trial that relates to official acts. So, for example, redacted is on the people's witness list. Uh Uh-oh, who's that? During grand jury testimony, so-and-so said this, and then they said this, and then they said this. Oh, my gosh. And similarly, they said this. According to so-and-so, that's what happened. Wow, I know. Shocking. So here, after all of that, they say, look, summarizing, they say Alvin Bragg doesn't tell us what his case is. We still have a lot of questions about what the evidence is. He doesn't have to give us the theory of his case or do, you know, tell us exactly what he's doing. But based on what it sounds like he's going to do, he's going to get a bunch of official acts stuff in here. We think we're immune from that. You can't say that we're not immune from that because the case is currently pending with SCOTUS. And that means you can't have this trial and use that evidence at the same time because that evidence might be immune. It's pretty smart, pretty brilliant actually, right? We were trying to think about how they can delay this trial and now they're just grabbing onto a little bit of evidence that Alvin Bragg brought up and said, eh, sorry, if you're going to talk about that. Well, we got to wait for SCOTUS, man. SCOTUS is going to take some time. So you got to delay your trial. Here's what Trump's team says. Here, Trump is immune from state prosecution based on official acts. Say, under the executive vesting clause, state courts and prosecutors, they cannot sit in judgment over a president's official acts. We're very familiar with this argument. If they can, if someone else can sit in judgment over their official acts, they're the president, right? They have more power than the president. If Trump needs to fill out a form to declassify something, who really has the declassification power? The president or the person who reads the form? Okay, so the president does. So you can't usurp that. Now, that's exactly what they're trying to do here. Saying in Marbury versus Madison, The president is invested with certain political powers and he uses them at their discretion, his or her discretion. The acts are only politically examinable and they can never be examinable by the courts. So how can Judge Chutkin sit in judgment over something that Trump did officially, which was to investigate our rigged elections? Hmm. SCOTUS is going to tell us. They say the supremacy clause also prohibits state and local officials from trying to use their power to defeat their legitimate opponents. Saying also presidential immunity from criminal prosecution also comes from the Constitution. And I'm fast forwarding a little bit here because we have seen essentially these exact same arguments many times before. And now these arguments are at the Supreme Court. The impeachment judgment clause also says a president cannot be criminally prosecuted for their official acts unless they're first impeached and convicted by the Senate. It's literally the same arguments in the J6 case. Yeah, if you wanted Trump to be convicted or prohibited from running again, disqualified, got to actually impeach and convict. If you think that you can prosecute him in a different court, you got to impeach and convict. It shatters that immunity. Now, this was the understanding of our founders. James Wilson participated at the Philadelphia Convention, and he said that he is amenable, the president is amenable to the laws in his private character as a citizen and in his public character by impeachment. 
Alito made the same point. We've referred to Federalist number 65 many times here. The president requires immunity in order to do their job. Without immunity from criminal prosecution based on official acts, the president's political opponents will do exactly what they're doing here today. They'll seek to influence and to control his or her decisions via de facto extortion or blackmail with the threat of prosecution. The threat will hang like a millstone around every future president's neck, distorting the presidential decision-making and undermining their independence. And we've definitely seen this one, this line in the J6 cases. So they say history also tells us that this is important. There was an unbroken tradition of not exercising the criminal prosecutorial power of presidents for official reasons. Why? The power doesn't exist. 234 years until we got here. History abounds with other examples of presidents who could have been prosecuted if they had Tishy James and Alvin Bragg and Fannie Willis and Jack Smith. John Quincy Adams, he made an alleged corrupt bargain, appointed Henry Clay as Secretary of State. Bush lied to Congress and all of us, said that Hussein possessed stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. Remember that garbage? Thousands of Americans dead. Thanks, Bush. Obama authorized drone strikes, killing U.S. citizens, and his teenage son just took them out, no problem. They also include Clinton. He pardoned Mark Rich. He used airstrikes in the Middle East to distract from Monica Lewinsky, prosecute him. How about Biden's egregious mismanagement of the border? Biden's alleged material support for terrorism. He funded the UNRWA despite its history of direct support for terrorism. How about billions of dollars that he's giving over to Iran? It's blowing people up all over the world. Now, despite numerous examples of presidents allegedly committing criminal behavior, no one's ever prosecuted them before, not in 234 years. Not until Trump. Now, other immunity is given to other people, obviously. Congress has it. Judges have it. We're familiar. Members of Congress are immune from criminal prosecutions. When they're in the scope of their legislative duties, judges get it when they're in the scope of their legislative duties. And public policy supports this as well. Presidents need to act with bold and unhesitating action. And if they're constantly tiptoeing around whether they're going to get prosecuted by Fannie Willis, they're not going to be able to do their job. And so in this case, we have to adjourn this trial. Now, we can't do it right now. Now, while the concept of presidential immunity is firmly established, we know that we talk about it, the doctrine's scope is a serious and unsettled question of law. And so therefore, this court, Judge Juan, should adjourn this trial until the court, the Supreme Court, resolves Trump versus United States. They say, now, while adjournments are ordinarily committed to the sound discretion of the trial court, in some situations, when the protection of a fundamental right has been involved in requests for an adjournment, that discretionary power has been narrowly construed. This is just outstanding. So they are pulling this, they're trying to pull this case away from Juan Mercan, just like they did with Judge Chutkin. They pulled this maneuver literally with Judge Chutkin, saying, since we're appealing this, you no longer have this case. We're taking it from you now. They're getting very close, saying, Judge, you don't have the discretionary power here to deny this. Very narrowly construed, like you do, but you gotta, you gotta really think about this. You might have to adjourn this. Why? Because of the importance of the presidency in the constitutional order, as well as the supremacy clause, and related federal principles, federalism principles implicated here, the adjournment, the postponement is warranted here to ensure proper adjudication of the presidential immunity defense and to prevent improper evidence of official acts, which might be immune, from being used in an unprecedented fashion, never before seen, by Bragg. Waiting to try this case until after SCOTUS addresses this question. And by the way, oral argument is just next month, just right around the corner. It's going to simplify the application of these evidentiary issues here. Now, we've discussed this below. We have questions about the scope of official acts. It's a developing area of the law. We don't really even know what it means. And so this adjournment is going to avoid the unnecessary risk of inconsistent adjudications. 
You might say it's not immune. All that evidence comes in. SCOTUS comes out, says, sorry, immunity applies to all that. We don't want to have to reopen this case and do this all over again, do we? By President Trump, it relates to his immunity. And so the adjournment would mitigate the risk that an error in the application of this complex issue would, oh, there it is. It would expend resources and we would have to retry the case, right? You don't want to do this all over again, do you, Judge? Do you? No. So just wait. Say, Bragg must be precluded from offering evidence of this. It's official acts. So it's, it's, it's protected. Saying the presidential immunity doctrine is capacious by design. Trump's entitled to immunity for everything that falls within the outer perimeter. The president's actions do not fall beyond the outer perimeter of official responsibility merely because they are unlawful or taken for a forbidden purpose. Supreme Court has even said that. And so the court must preclude this evidence. Sorry, Alvin. In assessing whether immunity applies, the court must look to the nature of the act itself. There's not always a clear line between this. What's the difference between personal and official? The question is whether the action can be reasonably be understood as official. Now, this inquiry does not consist of trying to identify speech that would benefit a president politically. When an appropriately objective and context-specific assessment yields no clear answer in either way, the president, in our view, should be afforded immunity. So it's a protective doctrine. Now, in the current posture, this requires the court to preclude Bragg from offering into evidence Trump's official acts. For example, in Johnson, the Supreme Court held that they couldn't use stuff in that case. And under those standards, Trump's social media posts, his public statements, all the stuff when he was president, those fall within the outer perimeter of the presidential duty. And if you don't understand how it works specifically, you can delay this case until SCOTUS decides. And if it's questionable, tie goes to the defendant. You give them the immunity. Tie break goes to the defense. They say Trump's statement in April of 18 from Air Force One is a powerful example of why context is important. He was on Air Force One. And with respect to his social media posts, the official act's conclusion is also supported by the fact that his Twitter account was one of his main vehicles for conducting official business. Second Circuit has held that the official nature of the account is overwhelming, right? First Amendment. Now, the Office of Government Ethics established in 1978 also provides some information on this. They say all of Trump's communications were regulated. So since they're regulated, those are also official acts as well. And finally, wrapping this up, they say there is no constitutionally significant distinction to be drawn between documents and testimony for purposes of presidential immunity. Thus, the court must preclude Bragg from eliciting these testimony and other testimony disclosed by this person and by this. Same rules apply for these witnesses and others. This, as we can see, is signed by Todd Blanche. It says, for the foregoing reasons, the court should adjourn the trial, review the scope of presidential immunity, let the Supreme Court decide, then have an evidentiary hearing to distinguish what is personal, what is presidential, what's inside the hula hoop, what's outside, and then preclude all of the evidence of Trump's official acts at trial based on presidential immunity. So this is going to be very interesting. And I think Judge Juan Mercan is going to do everything he can to deny this request and keep the trial on track. I think he'll just probably say it's all not official and allow the trial to stay on path. Because if he, if he delays this past the SCOTUS oral arguments, he's going to run into the same problem that Judge Chutkin has. In other words, they're both going to try to get their trials back on the calendar simultaneously. And they're going to run into problems because now we're getting close into election season. So it 
feels to me like it's a you know it's not sure I'm not sure it's a motion that they'll win on ultimately whether those acts were presidential or not my understanding is actually some of the payments to Cohen were also done in 2017 when he was the president so we're, we have questions now about whether there will be a test about what is included and what is excluded and you could make the argument as well that this actually might hurt him in the Supreme Court case because it might cause some justices to say, see, if we grant him immunity, he's going to use it even for that stuff. Like he's going to use it in a scope that's bigger than they intend to use it. But, it, you know, Supreme Court is going to decide a lot on this. I think they are going to find that there is presidential immunity. Now, the test, right, how do you define what the hula hoop is? And how do you declare what's inside, what's outside of it? That's going to be the big question. But... It's a, it's a very interesting filing. I think that the takeaway here is that they have identified something that is clearly that, you know, that they can latch onto. Like this is what defense attorneys live for. And so it's a beautiful maneuver, whether Judge Juan Mercan follows the rules and slows things down and, and allows SCOTUS to make a determination on this before going to trial. I doubt that happens. I think he's going to just try to keep this train on the track for the sole purpose that they're out of time. They're running out of time and they got to get this thing done. So then he'll say, Trump, you can appeal it. And he'll make some rulings on uh, the evidence. He'll say, uh, based upon the facts presented in the, in the trial. So, all right, interesting filing and Bragg's going to respond to that. Trump's going to respond to that. Judge will probably deny it immediately. The next question is going to be the appeal. Okay. So this is, this is kind of the same thing that happened, right? Follow this one step further. They followed the same pattern with Judge Chutkin. They said, Judge Chutkin, sorry, we have presidential immunity. Denied. So we're appealing it. She said, okay, appeal it all you want, but the trial stays on track. They say, no, it doesn't. SCOTUS says it does not. Then she had to backtrack and say, you're right. Trial is on hold. So same thing here. They're going to say trial's on hold in Chutkin's case while we're pending this in SCOTUS, so you should put our trial on hold because it involves so much of the same similar evidence. He's going to deny it, then they'll appeal that and they'll use the other, now this is state court versus federal court, but they'll use that other case law as precedent to say, see, when we appeal it, you have to stall the lower level proceedings. It's smart. It's very smart. They're trying to box Juan Mercan in. And he's basically out of time. Like he's got, we got two weeks from today. Very smart, very smart. And we're thinking it through kind of in real time here. So they'll get denied. They'll appeal it. They'll use Chutkin's ruling and the DC circuit's ruling saying that when it's on appeal, it stayed. And we'll see if they can, can stop this trial from happening in the next two weeks. Okay. So speaking of the onslaught that's happening in New York, Andrew Weissman is out now. And he wants to know who is helping Donald Trump. Okay, these people just can't ever let up, ever. It's nonstop with them. So, you know, they secure a $91 million bond from Trump. He posts the bond. It's like they, they want blood from a turnip, you know. He posts the bond and they say, that's not good enough. Where did he get the money from? And so Andrew Weissman showed up on MSNBC's hit show called Inside Jen Psaki, and here's what he had to say. You tweeted, my guess, Trump may have someone like Elon Musk co-signing the Chubb bond so the bank is comfortable being on the hook for the judgment. Same could happen for the bond for the AG uh, $450 million judgment. Can you explain to us what you mean, how that works, what you think is happening here? Sure. Um, well, you know, listening to your first segment, Jen, about whether Donald Trump is going to be successful in running as an outsider, this is an example of his running not just as an outsider, but as an outlaw. Uh. Um, and, you know, you not just the criminal cases, but you have these civil cases where he has judgments. He has two up to $91 million in the E. Jean Carroll case and obviously the $450 million in the New York fraud case. And the concern in the these civil cases with these civil judgments is who is the candidate beholden to? 
uh, is he somebody who is going to be making policy and being deferential Putin, to just say people it. who have put up money? You think and, it's Putin? You know, there's a simple way of looking at this is he has 450 million reasons to be deferential to? if somebody else is putting up the money Putin? or co-signing. So, for instance, Elon Musk, I'm not saying he is the co-signer, but you know, he has said, I have not given up money. But that's not the only way that you can get, help Donald Trump get a bond, he can actually mm -hmm. co-sign it. Um, and so that issue of who is actually behind this is something that people who are voting should know. All right, so it's never ending, right? It's just constant. He gets 91 million, where'd that come from? Must be Putin. He get that from the Saudis, Jared Kushner do it. Then they're like, he's a billionaire. So he's got plenty of money. Where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? He comes up with the money. Where'd he get the money? It's never ending with them, right? It's a double standard, as we know. Byron Donalds is here to explain what is ultimately happening. Obviously, Joe Biden has committed crime after crime after crime. His son has a whole book of, you know, his uh, best hit, greatest hits up there. And he, Byron Donalds, says, why is there a double standard? Why does Trump have to play by a different set of the rules? You keep saying that no one's above the law. Clearly, tons of people are above the law. Donald Trump isn't. Donald Trump's below the law. He has no protections. His you know, right to counsel, his attorney-client privilege is shattered. He gets indicted when no one else does. The list never ends. Here's Byron. House oversight and House, and House Judiciary are doing our jobs. We are requesting the information from the from the special counsel on his investigation into into Joe Biden. And let's be clear, this is not about Joe Biden's activities during his presidency. It is the fact that he did take classified information from a secure facility when he was vice president and when he was a United States senator. Both are a violation of the Espionage Act. And having a poor memory does not absolve you you from violating the Espionage Act. Being old and elderly does not absolve you from violating the Espionage no. Act. Apparently and it so does. So once again, Apparently you see does, the yeah. two-tier system of justice against Donald Trump simply because he is the Republican nominee and he is actually the person that would blunt the radical Democrat agenda. So what do the Democrats do? Weaponize the Department of Justice, go after their political ri rival. It is fascism here in the United That's States right. brought to us by Joe Biden and the Democrats. How Shout so out to Byron Donalds. Nice, nice statement there. And he's absolutely right about it. How'd those documents end up in Joe Biden's garage? How come Hunter Biden's memos to his comrades in Burisma and Ukraine, how come they all mirrored a lot of what sound like official skiff documents that Joe Biden would be looking at as the senator? No charges, nothing. But Donald Trump gets implicated every which way and they drag out people from the gutters to file civil lawsuits against him non-stop Byron Donalds calls it what it is fascism in America and he's right so that my friends of course is Donald Trump fighting to adjourn the criminal trial in New York we'll see if that happens I think it's a very interesting maneuver we're anticipating quick replies quick rulings on this probably a quick appeal and we'll see if the trial stays on track or if it moves onward either way we're going to be here covering it and the rest of the Trump prosecutions and trials and SCOTUS appeals and ballot removal attempts or whatever else comes next. We're gonna be here, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thanks for also checking out some of the links down in the description below. We have a great event coming up, watcherlodge.com, absolutely free. Would love to have you come and join us. It's a Saturday, two hour event. It's gonna be fun. We also have robertgovea.com. If you wanna grab the PDF we just read through, links are in the description below. And of course, our members only community where we do live streams in the morning. We do streams on Saturday and we do after parties after our live show, watching the watchers.locals.com. We'd love to have you join all of us everywhere, but if we don't see you there, we'll see you right back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day. Now it's time to hear from you. We covered some good ground. Trump fighting to adjourn the New York trial. We'll see if he gets that done. It is going to be a battle. Judge Juan is not going to want to move it. And Fannie accused of witness tampering in a very fun motion from Robert Cheely that was calling her out for exactly what happened, for being a felon. Felonious Fannie. It's going to be her new nickname, maybe. All right. Now it's time to hear from you, my friends, of course. I appreciate all your amazing support. And as soon as we're done here, we're heading over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com to debrief. But let's see who is in the house on this amazing, incredible day. 
And we've got, who's here? John McGarvey is here clipping for us. Thank you, John. John is here. We got bringing in Quantum Thug Life. Who's here? Quantum Thug Life is bringing in five Membos. Oh my goodness. Quantum Thug Life thugs it out in multiple dimensions. Deepwood, Mr. P, Deborah E, Philip H, and Brad T coming in courtesy of Quantum. Thank you, Quantum. Very great to see you in the house. This is Rob, hurry and turn on that big, beautiful spotlight before we start getting into mischief and defund daylight savings time. I agree with that. Yeah, I don't know why the rest of the country changes. Um, it's, kind of a, uh, it's kind of a strange thing. And yeah, uh, all right, we're going to leave that one aside. We got this one from former in the house. Yeah, daylight savings time is a strange thing. But former's in the house says, let me talk about the state of our economy. I filled up my diesel truck and expected the pump to shut off at 100 so I could restart the pump and finish filling my tank. Fuel has gotten so expensive that the pump ran to $200 without shutting off. They lifted the limit up, huh? Yeah. Well, it's Biden's economy, former. It's going to happen in a lot more places. Yeah. Like our medical bills and elsewhere. Pinecone, what's up? Bringing in five membos. Michelle B. WM. We got Brandy Coffees here. Salty old guys joining us. And Redeemed C is in the house. Great to have you. And thank you, Pinecone, for bringing in our newest of membos. We got this one from Bob Dole. The senator? Hey, what's up, Bob Dole? Bringing in 10 new membos. Thank you for bringing 10 people in. Debbie E. Chad R. We are Sparta. Oh, Gloria, what's up? Hope Arising's coming in. Nikki G. Bill L. Michael's here. GNR Lawn Service. Sounds awesome. The Real Kittler's here. The Willie L. and James H. All gifted members, courtesy of Bob Dole. Thank you, Bob Dole. And Gloria B. says, nice, Bob Dole. Yeah, amazing. Good to have you. Welcome aboard. What's up, Ryan Patrick? Stopping on by. Says, smash that like button. What's up, Ryan? Good to see you, my friend. And thanks for saying that. Ryan's also on YouTube. We got PFUS says, since my pleas are falling on deaf ears, please sign this one. Oh, this looks like it's a change.org uh, petition. Demand all three debate from PFUS. So if you want to go support this, there's a change.org petition, apparently. If you want them all to debate. Yeah, I'd be fine with just, uh, I'd be fine just giving Joe a microphone for an hour. Uh, you know, just give him an hour. Like, but don't touch him though. Just give him the microphone. Just give Joe Biden the microphone for one hour and just let's see what happens. It's be, it'd be like a, like a wild safari on National Geographic. Like watch, watch, watch what he does. Let's see what he says. And then somebody can just say something in the crowd like mega and just see what he does for an hour. It'd be fun. It'd be a wild show. I think it'd have good, good, good views, good ratings. Oh, he's moving. Is he seeing his shadow? We'll see. All right. We got, that's a petition. This one from this minute uh, indoctrination says, must be nice to not have to deal with the trauma of a time change. As I get older, it gets worse. Just leave it alone. When you find out you can't tax people's daylight savings, AOC is very upset about that. Yeah, you can't just print more time, apparently. Sorry, AOC, you can't just print you know more hours in the day. Joe Mass says, by the way, if Judge McAfee is worried about spillover into other cases in the county, you just have to ask, did Fanny sleep with every prosecutor? That's not exactly. I don't know, maybe. No. Did Fanny perjure herself in other proceedings? No. Yeah, that's, well, now we don't know because she lied to the court. I mean, honestly, like she lied to the court. So you can't really trust her at all. That's where this, that's where this real spillover is going to be, right? If he finds that Fanny lied to the court, then the, every, every defense attorney is just going to say, she's a liar. <laughs> so I don't care what she says, judge. In every other case, Fanny's, uh, well, uh, the, the, the DA's office uh, says that this happened. Our witness is going to testify to this. Yeah, but you guys are liars. Like clearly every one of you just lied. Anna Cross put him on, knew he was lying. Adam Abate sat there, made closing arguments for a liar. We all know that they're lying. Nathan Wade's a liar. Fanny's a liar. So why aren't you guys all lying? If you lied in that case, why aren't you lying in my case? So the judge, yeah, the judge is in a, in a position, isn't he? You have to figure that out. Good to see you, Joe Maz. Hey, Kadiak is here. Says, what are the chances that Fanny and Tish were chosen to bring these cases to make all the dirty and illegal things they've done just go away? Thanks for shining the light. Uh... 
I think that they did all, a, a lot of dirtier things now. Like this is this has boosted them into the spotlight. You know, Fanny got a book being written about her. Nathan Wade got a new car. Like, did you see what he was driving? You know, you know, some some nice new Audi, I think it was. Like, they got boosted. They got like spotlight. You know, we're taken over. Uh, you know, give me some Grey Goose, baby. So, yeah, I think that this enabled them actually to do the things that they did. Hey, what's up, Fractal Machine? Says the defense keeps trying to prove the 50-50 scheme. Instead of arguing that, even if true, it should still be a conflict of interest, which is a shame. Yeah, I, I actually agree with this, Fractal. I think that they should emphasize more of the consortium, you know, the, the companionship, the love of your someone coming with you is a real benefit. And Nathan Wade wasn't able to do that by this appointment. So even it's not just a monetary thing, right? Does she, does she want to go to Belize by herself? Does she want to go to Napa Valley by herself? No, clearly not. So Highland Bull says, my word, if Fanny and her office were competent, they sound like they are the worst lawyers possible. No wonder they work for the government. In private sector, they would be out on the street with their abysmal performance. That's true. I think that's true. I think that's why a lot of people, you know, not everybody, I think there are good government workers, obviously, but some people go into, into work for that reason, I think. We got this one. From D. London, what's up, says, heightened duty of candor. Can you say hoist on their own petard? Exactly, yes. Hoist on their own petard. I can't say it, yeah. We can say it, D. London. It's a good one. And shout out to our friends in the UK. You're right. Fanny said, this is our standard. We're very honorable prosecutors. Like, oh, yeah? Well, why don't you prove it? Tell us the truth. What's up, Ray? Ray is here says MJT posting on X is suppressed J6 docs. Proves that clavicle girl lied and the President Trump did offer the National Guard and refused by Dems with more coming. I saw that. Yeah, it turns out clavicle girl's a big fat liar, okay? We all knew that too, by the way, from the very beginning. Clavicle, Trump reached up and grabbed him by the clavicle. Get out of here. Don't even need to know anything else. If you just watch that proceeding, are you ridiculous? Yes, clearly. So totally a liar, has been lying all over the media. Liz Cheney covered it up. Maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow, wild. What's up, Glocky's here, says, anyone with a brain already knew this, but I want the hidden message to be known to everyone. Talking about Clavicle Girl being a total dishonest person. Glocky says, so I'm gonna ask a rhetorical question. Why is the star witness for Jack Smith in Florida, the sham trial on CNN, going on CNN to testify? This is Brian Butler after moving boxes. Good question, but I'm going to look that one up for sure. What's up, Patrick G? Says Trump driver contradicts the J6 claim from the star witness. Clavicle girl. Yeah, that's her. You got it. Clavicle girl. Yeah. Clavicle girl. She very devious indeed, but her, you know, master plan is all coming undone. Sorry, clavicle girl. You lose. Yeah. Secret service agent refuted the claim and they covered the whole thing up. Hey, Dove Macy. What's up? Dove Macy says smashing good show, Rob. Thank you, Dove. And thank you for saying it that way. I like that. You know, smashing good. I like it. I feel, that's nice. I appreciate that. Jennifer says, is it true that clavicle girl has an audio book out? <laughs> Probably. Fiction at its finest. The hits just keep on coming. Tell me she doesn't read it herself. Somebody tell me that. I mean, does she read it herself? She has the most monotonous voice ever. Remember during that? I don't know where they found these people, but Judge Luddig and Clavicle Girl, they talk at like 0.25 speed. It's like, pick up the pace, man. We've got somewhere to go. Yeah, I don't know. She definitely has a book out. What else is she doing with her life other than, you know, being a TDSer. Hey, Jack Mack is here. Says Fanny Willis, quote, ego is about who's right. Truth is about what's right. Set your ego aside. Stop distorting legalese and case law to try to create nonsense to save yourself. She is such a shameless and foolish woman. It really is shameful, Jack. I was thinking about that. I'm like, oh my gosh. How, how could you even like carry about your day-to-day -day business. You know what I'm saying? Like 
Nathan Wade, presumably, like they sat together at that hearing. <laughs> it's like, uh, and they had, and they put that seat between them, you know, like Fanny didn't sit next to him. And now I want to go back to the original hearings. Like there were other hearings, remember? Because Fanny testified at the other hearing. Did she sit next to Nathan Wade at that other hearing when they were trying to throw Harrison Floyd back in prison? Did she sit next to him? Because she certainly didn't at this last hearing. She's like, we need like arms, like uh, keep your hands above the table, arms like distance. It's like, how do you just go in there? And you're just like, it's just shame. It's like, wow, they have no shame. They just don't care. They think that they're, you know, above board. Hey, what's up? Lovin' the Crake says, when did common sense disappear from our judicial process? So to be honest, I mean, I, you know, there was, a, there was a rapid, rapid shift in 2020. We saw everything change in 2020. Rules all bent uh, across the board, across the board because of COVID. Everybody changed everything. And I think common sense was, you know, already a diminishing skill or a diminishing asset that was in our world. But certainly after COVID, I would say it accelerated. There was a big fork in the road and went like this. Whoop. We have, hey, what's up? Roy says, looks like the chat issue has diverted some away from locals to one of the other platforms. Locals is being a little wonky on our end. Thanks for the heads up, Roy. We got B-Man says, the judge is such a staunch partisan. Tell me somebody isn't behind the scene from the DOJ. I wouldn't be surprised. It, you know, I think the DOJ has influence in many places. In New York, obviously, obviously there too. Jack Mack says, it's crazy that I watch you for entertainment, but I learned so much about the legal system and the law. You've really created a dynamic platform. Well, thank you, Jack. Thank you for saying that. We try to have fun. We try to, you know, learn something. I'm learning stuff all the time, by the way. I mean, I'm learning, like, that's a new argument. That's cool. I have a, a lot of fun and I learn a lot and I learn a lot from you. So thank you for that, Jack. Thanks for being here and for the dono. Glocky says, did y'all see where Trump called out Zuckerberg for breaking the law? The same one that Democrats sent Dinesh to prison for? Says, not going to lie, Glocky. Outlaws are cool. Trump should get that tatted on him. 1776 outlaw. That's a pretty good one. We got Spud saying, hit show. I want to hit myself for watching Saki. Yeah, it's a hit show. Yeah, and the name of that show, what a weird name. This old guy says, wow, could it possibly be that Trump is just really, really good credit risk? Weissman is so disconnected from reality, it's no longer funny. I know, some, I, we have to play him, you know, because it's just easy to kind of dunk on him a bit. JMZ, what's up? Bringing in a new Membo. Renewin Outcast is in the house. Renwin Outcast coming in courtesy of JMZ. Hey, what's up? Semaj... Uh, Mayor, no, no, that's Samaj. What's up, Samaj? Good to see you, Samaj. Our newest supporter, welcome aboard. Samaj Eno Iram. In the house. It, it, it feels like it's a backwards name to me because you also capitalize the M. Anyways, welcome aboard, Samaj. Good to have you. Ms. J is here. What's up, Ms. J? Our newest membo on the YouTubes. Roger N says, I hope Judge M knows that he's more likely to be reelected if he does the right thing. I know I wouldn't vote for him if he doesn't disqualify Phil Willis and Wade. What are the people in Fulton going to say? I mean, it's a very blue, like 73% for Joe, if the numbers right, if the numbers are right. And the, his, 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 he's got two opponents now, I believe. So yeah, he's going to be a tall, tall order. We got, hey, what's up, per, per, Perpetus Augustus says, remember when that guy interrupted Obama to just yell, you lie. Why did no one interrupt Biden when he was accusing them of overthrowing democracy? Yeah, it's a good question. We don't have much pushback on the J6 or the criminal prosecutions of Trump from really anybody in Congress or much of the mainstream Republicans. They've kind of just abandoned that to Trump. That's his problem. Uh, we'll let the DOJ decide like Ron DeSantis and remember Nikki Haley. Well, we'll just let the courts play out, whatever happens. Hey, no, wrong answer, okay? The courts are not legitimate anymore. Or the, the, the DOJ is not legitimate in this prosecution. And so you guys should know that. And the fact that they didn't was disqualifying, which is probably why they lost, but in addition to other reasons. But the point is, yeah, Biden gets interrupted. I think Marjorie Taylor Greene did 
did interrupt him, you know, say her name for Lake and Riley. And he said, yeah, Lincoln right here. <laughs> Pritchie's here. Says midnight here in the UK. Just got in and switched it on. What's up, Pritchie? Well, thanks for joining us. It's a beautiful night over there, I'm sure. And I hope that you enjoyed the show and enjoy the show. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so thank you, Pritchie, for that one. And my friends, thank you for all those amazing donos. Thank you for sending those in. Always grateful for your tremendous support. Let's say hello to our friends on X. Let's make sure we didn't miss anything. And I think we've got... Amazing. We got those here. Um, Oh, we got some breaking news on the classified documents case. So Judge Cannon has just granted a motion to request for a 10-day extension to file replies. That's good. Trump submitted that today. We got a bunch of uh, motion work happening right now in the classified documents case in Florida. Let's see who's joining us on X. We've got Fred Petamonte, Al Holman says, ironic, both Trump and Fannie want immunity because of an election to a constitutional office. Liberté says they hit Fannie with the dictionary. Did you like that? I did that one intentionally. Salty says, Wade and Yurdy both testified that Wade visited the Hateville condo. Fannie said it never happened. Said the well-to-dos and the not-to-goes to cabins in the Appalachians, they go to chalets. That's why Wade pondered that question. Okay, Wade's well, like, oh no, we didn't go to cabins. We went to chalets. Derp, <laughs> Gally May says they're arrogant enough to think that Trump doesn't have friends or business partners. If they don't like him, everyone must not like him. Salty says, Rob, you sprang forward two hours today. I missed the early bird special. And no, that wasn't a fanny pun. We did, we did our members only stream this morning, but also at the same time. What's up, Fred? Says, as much as I hate saying this, I don't believe McAfee will disqualify either nor will perjury charges be brought. Sad, but true, I think. I hope you're wrong about that. Jameson Smith, what's up, Pamela Fiddler? Good to see you guys, my friends. Thanks for commenting over on X. If you want to follow us on X, it's at Rob Govea ESQ. And of course, always fun to follow the other watchers out there all across the wild world of X. But that is it for us on the day. We are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com to hang out and debrief a little bit. As a reminder, if you go over to watcherlodge.com, you're gonna find that we have this calendar and the community calendar is gonna have this discover your purpose and goals workshop with my mama coming in and we'd love to have you come and join us. So go to watcherlodge.com, click here, click this add to calendar, click this button to register to go and uh, join us, come join us. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Taking place on Saturday, gonna be two hours, Come taking notes, come prepared, ready to answer some hard questions and, you know, do some good work. I'll be there. Mama's going to be there. It's going to be fun. RobertGovea.com, where we do our PDF storage. We also have our newsletter over there. So be sure to sign up there and get all of our newsletters delivered to your inbox. And of course, watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is where we're going right now. Shout out to our mods and meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things nice and orderly on the day. Shout outs to our friends, Vienticus Prime, K Bean, we got Just Cause, we got Playin' Hooky, Ronnie Cole, our friend Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, Janek, Dog Digger, our friend Donut Mind Me, clipping hard for us today, along with John McGarvey, helping out. Thank you both for your help today. We got Jigam Gigam, Nathan N810, and Sleepy Dog Lee, making this place nice and beautiful. But that, my friends, is it. For us, on the day, we are going to be back here tomorrow. It's going to be a beautiful Tuesday. We're going to have a lot of business to get to. And we're going to need to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. See you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.